Yes, thanks a lot, Sama, for the introduction and also, Adam, for the very excellent talk on the basics of perfusion, especially in CT. Now it's quite a hard role for me, following this high IQ lecture, uh, to go to the lo low IQ uh, clinical approach, what we can do with uh, perfusion imaging. However, um, even taking into account that not everybody has the ability to measure perfusion in their clinical practice in the way it was just explained, or not yet, which might come pretty soon. There are, and I totally agree with your statement that uh, perfusion gives us very important clinical information uh, for our patient in many CNS uh, diseases. And therefore, I would like to thank again Olea for putting together this symposium uh, to allow us to share some of our experience, uh, both in the uh, clinical environment in stroke imaging with CT, but also what I would like to present uh, in MR imaging in several uh, neurologic diseases, um, to share this information with you and to see how important perfusion is in our daily clinical practice. So it's hard for us uh, on the radiology side to compete with our clinical partners because our clinical partners, they throw a lot of clinical questions on us uh, on a day-to-day -day practice uh, because they want to know or they want to have answers to many, many questions. And I have summarized them in my introduction slide because uh, in many CNS diseases, uh, they would like to know, uh, for example, is there a lesion present? Could be an ischemic lesion, could be a tumor, could be something else. Um, is this lesion uh, important? Does it make any complications that uh, need immediate intervention? Uh, what is the differential diagnosis in tumors, for example? Is it a tumor, yes or no? What kind of tumor? Um, what is the grading? Uh, how should we treat? Because then around the therapy, we are faced again with a lot of questions. And those are, for example, about the treatment decision. Um, if you are talking about surgeons, uh, the approach, what is the best way to reach a lesion, um, or also in vascular interventions, uh, how can we approach this? And then uh, if you are talking about uh, radiation oncology, uh, they would like to have the best delineation um, of a lesion uh, because they are planning their treatments on based on what we provide them with our imaging findings. And then uh, it doesn't stop with the therapy. Uh, it comes back after therapy. We are asked to monitor the treatment response. And not only to monitor the treatment response, we should also detect and monitor treatment side effects. And uh, especially in oncology, we do see more and more side effects, very complex side effects, which are based on standard imaging. We are not able to uh, differentiate them. So, and with a standard MR imaging protocol, or even with some uh, CT protocols, we are not able to answer those questions. And therefore, we uh, had a meeting a few years ago where we did sit together, and Salva um, uh, mentioned that before, we need uh, recommendations on how we image our uh, CNS diseases. And this is, for example, on how we uh, deal with, uh, like, oncology, like with neoplastic lesions in the central nervous system, and it was an expert meeting uh, from experts around the world, and we came up um, with a standard recommendation of, of what should be included into our protocols, and as you can see here, <clears throat> this is a summary of what we should include. You see there are two different perfusion methods in there. It's um, the T2 star perfusion measurement, which was uh, um, most often used in stroke before, uh, but it's also T1 dynamic MRI, so dynamic contrast enhanced imaging, where we look at the uh, time, uh, the in, uh, contrast enhancement over time. Uh, of course, we then also should add bold fMRI uh, to see where the uh, important cortical lesions are, or we can uh, use susceptibility weighted images or other modern imaging techniques in the assessment. But you see we have two contrast media injections, and that what we are doing today in MRI. We often split our contrast media dosage, and we give two injections, especially in stroke. Uh, we combine the T2 star perfusion imaging and MR angiography, and in tumors we uh, use the injections for T1 and T2 star uh, perfusion imaging, but I would like to focus on that later on. And um, then um, out of that same expert group coming or translating this, uh, m uh, this protocol into our clinical practice, we came up with a couple of questions, and the questions have been, of course, 
what do we need technically to get good perfusion imaging? And I think Adam gave a, a very interesting talk about what we can do in CT. And we are, we are faced with the same problems in MRI. There are a lot of algorithms out, um, and we have to optimize our algorithms and also the acquisition strategies uh, of our imaging studies to get the best results out of our imaging data. And this is summarized here, it was published last year. And um, as you can see here, that's how we can answer a couple of those questions. Um, and I have just filled in not the clinical questions, I have filled in the methodologies that we can uh, use here. And they include uh, functional imaging techniques like perfusion imaging, like diffusion tensor imaging, like susceptibility weighted imaging. And we use those methods today on a very routine basis in the initial diagnostic workup of our patients, as well as in the treatment decision and treatment planning process, and then more often uh, uh, in the following uh, of therapeutic interventions. So, but why to use perfusion imaging in a clinical context? Well, we get, um, that's quite easy to answer, we get a better insight into the pathophysiology of the diseases, no doubt about that. Um, um, it can improve our differential diagnosis. I will go and show that uh, to you in uh, brain tumors. Um, we will have an improved patient management because we can better decide what kind of optimal treatment we can offer to the patient. We have a better treatment planning, not only in tumors, but also in interventional procedures. If we know the pathophysiology of a stroke much better, uh, we can better plan for uh, vascular interventions, for example. Uh, biopsy can be better planned. Uh, we can even uh, introduce targeted biopsies because if we know what is the most malignant part of the tumor, we can especially target that to get the best uh, match with uh, the histologic nature of the tumor. Um, and then that summarizes in a kind of an individualized uh, treatment planning and treatment decision. And then, of course, uh, we have the improvement of uh, the therapeutic monitoring. In the past, we did most of those decisions based on PET imaging. We used FLT PET, for example, to look at the timidine kinase activity, which was a marker for tumor proliferation in tumors, or we looked at FDG, uh, the higher the metabolism, for example, the more malignant the tumor is. But we do have um, perfusion methods that don't provide the same, inf uh, like identical information, of course, not as quantitative, but uh, some similar methods, and those are dynamic contrast enhanced uh, imaging, where we um, have can assess the vascularity and the vessel permeability of tumors. We look at amplitude and exchange rate constants. Uh, it's a contrast enhanced technique, which we can do with a single dose of contrast media or with half the dose of a contrast media. Ha lowering the dose on the other side means we need more robust and more sophisticated post-processing software. Um, and um, just here in this example, this is a, a malignant glioma, and everybody would agree that this looks like a very homogeneous enhancing tumor, but it's histologically, as well as from the perfusion markers, a very heterogeneous tumor. As you can see here, we have areas of high perfusion, and we have area of low perfusion, and we know from histologic studies where we targeted those different areas that we have different genetic profiles even in those uh, tumors. Dynamic susceptibility weighted imaging, uh, the so-called perfusion imaging, how we called it before, the surrogate par parameter of perfusions are the already mentioned CBF and CBV values. And again here, we use a dynamic acquisition with either half the dose or the full dose of contrast media. And we can also better assess the heterogeneity of the tumor. Again, here an extreme example. This tumor looks very homogeneous on the conventional imaging. However, if you look on detail, and that's the overlay of the, uh, or the parameter image of CBV in this case, we see that it's not a homogeneous tumor at all. There are some hotspots, and we learned over the last couple of years that those hotspots represent the most malignant parts of the tumor. So then the second five questions we have to answer is what is really the clinical benefit of uh, perfusion imaging? 
And uh, we looked at different indications, and I would like to focus only because also in respect of time and because there's the most data available on uh, tumor imaging and stroke imaging. Um, and in brain tumors, we use dynamic susceptibility contrast and dynamic contrast enhanced perfusion techniques. Uh, stroke is the most second important uh, perfusion uh, indication, and here we use dynamic susceptibility contrast, often in combination with MR angiography. Neurodegeneration, a very important disease, uh, looking at our overaging population, especially in the Western world. Um, we can use perfusion to better assess uh, degeneration of the brain, um, or we can, like some more rare or not so well established uh, diseases like epilepsy, for example, where also the first studies are available to look at perfusion measures to better define where the epileptic focus is. So focusing on brain tumors first, um, so what can we get as additional information from perfusion imaging? We get a better differential diagnosis. We get a better tumor grading. Um, we can probably better um, assess our treatment decision in respect of timing, how fast we should treat a patient, for example. Um, we can optimize our biopsy and treatment planning and we can optimize our treatment follow-up. And what I would like to have is a very fast, in the clinical decision tree, I would like to have a very fast, very robust uh, evaluation of the perfusion parameters, as many as possible, to get a better insight into the heterogeneity of a tumor. And this is, for example, from Olia Sphere. Um, a few clicks and you have all these maps available through all the, uh, the the brain, and you can have a first very good insight into how your how the into the heterogeneity of your tumor. Um, in the differential diagnosis, uh, differential diagnostic process, uh, perfusion is very very helpful. For example, you have a lesion here uh, in the brain. Patient presented with a seizure. And the key question is, is this lesion a tumor, yes or no? That's a very important clinical decision we have to give, and we are asked by our clinical partners. Um, based on the morphologic features, that's often not possible. Here, of course, I would like probably to predict that this is a cortical dysplasia, but I don't know. It might be a malignant or a low-grade tumor. And if you look at the perfusion, this can give you additional information. This is a lesion that is not highly perfused. It has no contrast enhancement. Uh, so this is more likely a non-tumorous lesion. And it was later on confirmed as a cortical dysplasia. Uh, on the other side, if we know that there is a tumor already available or present, um, this is a case which I like very much because here we had histological confirmation first. Patient was operated on a low-grade astrocytoma. You see the resection cavity. And this young lady came back with um, a recurrent tumor, uh, non-enhancing. And the key question is, what should we do with this patient? Our current protocol says that in a low-grade astrocytoma, and this was the initial diagnosis based on the conventional imaging findings, we have a watch-and-wait principle. That means we wait until the tumor grows or until we see a contrast-enhancing lesion, which confirms that it is a malignant tumor, and then we immediately start treatment. However, in this patient, and this is quite a while ago, so it's not done with the latest version of the software, but we could find that this is a highly perfused tumor. And we knew from histological correlation studies that the higher the perfusion, the more malignant is the tumor. We could say that this is a non-enhancing low-grade astrocytoma. And this immediately changed the treatment decision uh, of this patient. So we went to the neurosurgery because it's in the dominant hemisphere. We did an fMRI of the Broca and Wernicke, and then uh, referred the patient to surgery, and it was confirmed as a high-grade astrocytoma. So complete uh, change of the treatment paradigm in this patient based on the information about perfusion. We know that uh, high-grade astrocytomas are somewhere in between uh, uh, low-grade astrocytomas are in their CBV values somewhere in between normal gray and white matter. We know this already since 13 uh, years at least. Um, and then whenever the perfusion values or CBV, CBF values are higher than normal gray matter, then we can predict that this is a high-grade tumor. And this is translated in our daily clinical practice already. 
And then the next step, you have seen this case before, very homogeneous tumor, uh, and oh, the error uh, moved a little bit, but uh, we depicted this as the optimal target for the um, uh, biopsy because then we can uh, depict the most malignant part of the tumor, and here it was confirmed as a high-grade astrocytoma, which has a complete different treatment than a low-grade astrocytoma, as predicted from the initial conventional imaging study. This is also a very important slide because this is um, also from an older study where we had um, this watch and wait principle and we looked at patients that did respond or did not respond or it's better to say that remained stable and others that did not remain stable within a, a two-year follow-up uh, period. And uh, all were histologically confirmed as low-grade fibrillary astrocytomas but we had two different populations there. Some of them progressed immediately or within the first few years, and the others remained stable, some of them over five, six, seven years. Um, and the only difference that was found was the initial RCBV value, which was significantly higher in those patients who did not remain stable. And our interpretation of this data is that just the histological diagnosis, which was mainly done uh, by biopsy, was just wrong. They, they, they did choose the wrong biopsy site and did not, uh, were not be able to pick the most malignant part of the tumor. In the follow-up, um, we often use perfusion to better predict whether we have in new enhancing lesions or in changes of the morphology of the lesion uh, to differentiate between treatment-related changes and tumor-related changes. And here, a classical case, new, uh, after radiochemotherapy, a new enhancing area uh, within the tumor. Key question, treatment-related or tumor-related. Conventional imaging does not help at all. We need the perfusion information because whenever you see a highly perfused area, you can be pretty sure that this is not uh, treatment-related. That's most likely tumor-related. Um, it has a high neovasculature, and therefore we see this uh, high perfused area. And this was confirmed as a recurrent uh, high-grade astrocytoma. Uh, another case here, um, here correlation with some PET imaging, where we can clearly see in the perfusion study that there is a high perfused area um, of this uh, not even enhancing area, um, and this is very suspicious to be a recurrent tumor. Another case here, radiochemotherapy. A uh, patient had uh, radiation therapy and temozolomide, and we do have a lot of enhancement here at the resection, uh, at the border of the resection cavity. We cannot answer based on our standard imaging whether those are treatment related changes or tumor related changes. Uh, but then if you look at the perfusion values, you see there are areas of high perfusion. Uh, those are treatment uh, tumor-related changes, and it was confirmed as a grade 3 astrocytoma. Uh, but the majority of the enhancement is not at all tumor-related. That's just treatment-related, and we can leave it alone and say, okay, we only need to focus on this area of the tumor. Another case here from Cem Charlie from Izmir, 74-year-old uh, female with glioblastoma, post-surgery, uh, post-radiation therapy. You see that very complex post-operative finding, but there is no increased uh, perfusion. So this uh, is a normal standard follow-up. You can uh, prolong your follow-up um, period, and there is no suspicion of a recurrent tumor. In another case here, this is a... Um, Again, a new enhancing area uh, at, the resect at the border of the tumor. And the key question is this treatment related. If you have um, uh, quite a low perfusion in this area, some areas are high, but the majority of this is just treatment related, low perfusion values, and this was then histologically confirmed as a, a radiation necrosis. Very early in the early assessment of uh, tumors after combined radiochemotherapy, we have a so-called pseudoprogression uh, time period where it's very hard to assess the tumor just based on standard imaging uh, techniques. So here you have this uh, tumor here in the posterior fossa. You see that there is more enhancement. The tumor seems to be growing 
Um, and it's then a very sensitive time, so we don't know whether we should continue with the treatment, if we should add an additional treatment. We can still offer additional radiation treatment uh, in a lot of those cases. And then we can also wait. Like here we did uh, a six-week follow-up, and uh, it remained stable. Uh, but we can also answer that question a little bit earlier by just adding perfusion. You see here the initial uh, highly perfused tumor, and then on that sensitive time where we do see a lot of those pseudo-progressive uh, changes, uh, we have a low perfusion. So this is clearly a pseudo-effect. It's not a tumor-related effect, and we can calm down the clinical partners and say, okay, we can wait there's no need for an additional treatment or for an additional chemotherapy or an additional radiotherapy. We can just wait. This is not highly perfused. It's most likely a pseudoprogression. In stroke, and we heard a lot about stroke in CT, um, there's also still a role of perfusion imaging in MRI of stroke because we discussed about the penumbra uh, principle before. Um, MRI is very sensitive or most sensitive in the detection of the infarct core, but it's very hard often to define whether the patient is a candidate for treatment or not. And I don't want to go very deep into the discussion and just show a few of the clinical examples um, where it was in, this, in these cases quite easy uh, to give an, an answer about the uh, role of treatment because here we have a very small infarct core and a large perfusion deficit based on the occlusion of the vessel. And here it was clear that this is a candidate for a reassessment. Here in this patient, an intracranial stenosis. You see small areas of infarct core, a large perfusion deficit, and this can be optimized much better with the newer Bayesian algorithms, for example. Um, and then we can better define that there is a need for uh, treatment of the patient, and here an intracranial stand was put in. With uh, the software tools that are available today, we can even quantify the volume of the mismatch quite easily. It's only a few steps, a few clicks, and you can quantify the mismatch uh, for better immediate treatment uh, decision. Uh, can be done within a few seconds. You have uh, within a few clicks all the uh, parameters that you need available to make that uh, clinical decision. Just a few words at the end about T1 dynamic imaging. This method is not as progressed or developed um, and established as the T2 star perfusion method because it needs more mathematical post-processing. But in theory, what we look for is we look at the signal intensity time curve of the T1 enhancement. Um, because in the brain it's easy, um, we only see enhancement where we do not have a uh, blood-brain barrier or where we have a disrupted blood-brain barrier, and then we look at the exchange rate. And we can use this um, to quantify exchange rate parameters, and uh, we can get information about vascularity and permeability of our uh, lesions. And what is it good for? Um, it only works in enhancing tumors, of course, uh, but we can use it, for example, for better differential diagnosis and grading because not all high-grade tumors are the same. We know from newer studies that they have different genetic profiles, that they have different treatment responses, but it's very hard to predict at the beginning in the initial assessment whether uh, patients, for example, are candidates for very expensive, for example, anti anti-angiogenic treatments. And I would say that some of those patients are probably not candidates, and our perfusion uh, methods can give a little bit of an help in the decision whether we should treat those patients uh, or whether we should not treat them. And those are just two examples. Both are tumors with grade 4 astrocytoma histological confirmation. We have that small residual tumor, and we have a large uh, tumor uh, here uh, just biopsied, and uh, if you look at the signal intensity time curve, not only uh, not uh, primarily focusing on the parameter maps, but you see that the tumor um, enhancement over time is different, even if it's the same histology. This tumor is much slower enhancing uh, than this one. It has a lower vascularity, and it has a lower rate of exchange of the contrast media between the 
intravascular space and the extracellular space. So I would predict that this tumor is quite a good response candidate, and this one, um, uh, this one is a good response candidate, and this one not at all. And this was confirmed um, on the follow-up here that six months after therapy, uh, this tumor remained stable. Uh, he had a radiation uh, chemotherapy, and the flattening of the curve is a quite a good parameter of a successful treatment response. The other tumor within three months exploded, doesn't even respond uh, to therapy. This might have been a good candidate for an anti-angiogenic treatment because we knew already that it has a high angiogenic profile based on the imaging studies. And we did then targeted biopsy studies where we looked at uh, uh, different areas in the tumor, in heterogeneous tumors, and we did find, for example, of course, what we expected from the model, that we have a higher vascularity, but it's not only the vascularity that is higher, it's also the angiogenic profile uh, of that lesion. So whenever you have a high VEGF presentation, this is a good anti-VEGF candidate. Um, other areas, like here, where we have a low VEGF, these areas might not respond to an anti-VEGF therapy. And we can use that method also to better assess the treatment follow-up because uh, the signal intensity time curve is very different in those lesions where you have a recurrent tumor with a high vascularity compared to areas where we don't have a high vascularity where we have only a leakage and a damage of the blood-brain barrier. At the end, the tumors look the same because they both show contrast enhancement, but the time of the enhancement is uh, the time curve of the enhancement is totally different. So, as I mentioned before, today, and that uh, needs also especially a very good post-processing uh, software tools, uh, we combine protocols of dynamic susceptibility contrast and dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. Uh, the protocol recommendation is that you do first the T1 dynamic contrast enhanced scan uh, and then followed by the T2-star dynamic. Um, and that's for tumors. In a stroke, we would recommend to do first the uh, MRA study and then the dynamic uh, susceptibility contrast T2-star perfusion method. And with new software, um, that's Radiology 2014, it's a multimodality MR imaging approach in the assessment of tumors and other diseases. You see um, that we can within a few clicks, get all the information together from morphologic imaging, from perfusion, from diffusion tensor imaging, as well as from MR spectroscopy to better differentiate here, for example, here, uh, our brain tumors. So to summarize, uh, both perfusion methods in MRI, they are very important because they provide us non-invasive insights into the pathophysiology of different CNS diseases. It significantly improves uh, patient management, including differential diagnosis, treatment decision planning, and follow-up. But what is very important, and it was mentioned very nice in the first presentation already, we need a standardization of acquisition and post-processing. It's a very important prerequisite for the acceptance of the methods in the clinical environment. Uh, there's a need for easy and reliable post-processing algorithms and visualization of the results. Very important to get accepted in the radiology community as well as in the community of our clinical partners. And very important for all of you that are using perfusion in their protocols, include the results into your differential diagnostic process and into your reporting of the radiological exams. What is important? What... Uh, software requirements do we have? For me, of coming from an academic center, we need a few clicks only approach for clinical ev evaluation, uh, so easy and fast. And then also for those who are doing research on that, we need a software that provides a huge variety of post-processing models for our research applications. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. And for those who don't know where Winnipeg is, it's in the heart of uh, U.S. and Canada. Um, it's outlined here. We are 2,000 kilometers away from the Arctic and from the Mexican border. Thank you very much.